Thank you for joining us here in part three of this series on church revitalization. I, I hope that you really got something out of what Dr. Laws was sharing with you about uh, the biblical church. And I'm gonna refer to that in just a second. What I wanna do for the next just few minutes is really give you an overview of what we teach in the master's level class and also what I often do in conferences, but obviously try to pack that into an overview in about 20 minutes. So there, there are much uh, expanded versions of this that we would talk about as well. When we talk about church revitalization, one of the things that we're recognizing is we're just admitting some issues. The issue of the fact that many of our churches are unhealthy. And, and unfortunately, statistically, when you begin to look at the American church and you see some of these unhealthy trends that are happening, they become normal. And in my church consultation, even pastoral experience, it's almost become accepted that this is the way a church is. The, the, the church is almost expected to be unhealthy. And so one of the concepts that I just want to get across is, is we need a new normal. We, we, need, we need to not accept that expectation and we need to set standards. But, but I, also, I also always want to give you practical tools to get your hands on and things that you can use to help you get to that new expectation and not just preach about something and harp about something that, that, that then leaves you short. So, you know, we need this, this new expectation. You know, biologists talk about, in a biosphere and an atmosphere, they talk about species that are called health species or, or, or standard species that they'll, they'll look at. One of, those, one of those species are frogs. They, they'll look at frogs in a biosphere, and if, and if an environment doesn't have a healthy frog population, or honeybees are this way too, if they don't have a healthy honeybee population, there's something wrong with the whole environment because these species interact with both species kind of above and below on food chains as well as the pollination issue of honeybees. And so if, a, if the frog population isn't healthy, you got a problem. And in the, in the church, there are frogs and honeybees that you can look at. And you can begin to look at warning signs of health. Evangelism is frankly a frog. Uh, people don't share their faith not simply because uh, they don't want to or they don't, they don't have the knowledge to do so, although they may say that. In the end, overall, when you're looking at a church in terms of evangelism, of, the lack of evangelism isn't the problem. That's a symptom. The disease is still going to be in our relationship with God. Stewardship, discipleship, these are all frogs and honeybees, indicators that say something's not right. This, you know, when we look at the overall church, these pieces, these things that we want to evaluate don't look like they should. And I want to talk about that a little bit. The other thing I want to talk about a little bit are what I call train tracks and bumper cars. Anybody who's ever heard me, you, you'll roll your eyes because you know I always talk about train tracks and bumper cars. Many, many of our churches operate like bumper cars. Uh, everybody loves the bumper cars. People defend the bumper cars. They all want to ride the bumper cars. Bumper cars are cool. They're flashy. The music plays. The, the sparks fly. And everybody wants to ride the bumper cars. But in the end, all bumper cars do is run around in a circle bumping into each other. And in the end, you don't go anywhere. As compared to think in terms of the, the cars on a train that are hooked together, headed in a direction together, where there's a track heading toward a certain direction. And even though you might have different cars on the train, just like in church life, you might have different areas of spiritual discipline or ministries or even programs. But they're hooked together in a synergy heading toward a known destination, a known goal. And so what we're talking about is building a train and not riding around on the bumper cars. And so let's talk about that for a few minutes. And it all starts with this concept of why. We, we were talking about this a little bit earlier and how important this is. And Dr. Lawless has built on this. You need to know why you're doing what you're doing and what you're doing. But, but this, this idea of we've got to ask the right questions in the right order, this is so crucial, I can't overestimate it. When I, I teach a doctor of ministry seminar with Dr. Lawless, and, and at the end of the week, he asked his students what was the most important lesson of the whole week for them, basically, the most important lecture. And they all said the discipline of why, because they had forgotten why they do what they do. It's so easy to get caught up in the how. It's so easy to get caught up in the what, and we forget why we're doing what we do. You always have to ask why, then you ask who, then you ask what, then you ask how. And I'm going to show you that in some practical form, because that, that question, those issues, that order of question is vital for church revitalization. And you've got to constantly be coming back to why. Why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing this? Why, why are we doing that? You've got to constantly ask that. It's amazing how few churches do that. It's going to lead you to evaluation and assessment. It's going to lead you to re-identification. It's going to lead you to better vision development. It's amazing how few people do that.
And you've got to have this discipline of going back to the why question, not simply, okay, what do we need to do next? How are we going to do this next? What's the coolest, latest thing that somebody out there is doing, and how can we do that? Those are just not the right questions. You've got to come back to a biblical why. So we've got to ask these ultimate whys, the mission of revitalization, our mission itself, and that ultimate idea of bringing glory to God. That's got to be more than a bumper sticker. That's got to be more than just some catchy phrase. That's got to really define what we're after. And that affects methodology. That affects your programming. That affects your budget as to why we're doing what we're doing. And so we've got to go back to these verses that I alluded to in session uh, one with Dr. Lawless. This Matthew 16 concept of that Jesus is still the master builder. He owns the church. And the confusion between ownership and stewardship get us in trouble all the time. And we've got to move past that. So we've got to acknowledge Him and bring Him glory. And one of the ways we do that is by fulfilling the Great Commission. So missions and evangelism, discipleship and church health, those are not our goals. Now hear what I just said. I know these are sessions on church revitalization, but those are not our goals. Those are simply the means by which we bring Him glory. So the way we do these things and why we do these things really, really do matter. The motivation, the intent, the expectation is really significant or we'll miss the whole point of why we're doing what we're doing. So what revitalization does is it gives us the opportunity to kind of evaluate where we are, where we were should be, what's going on, where we're not, where we need to go, et cetera. Compare that to the environment around us and we can make some decisions about the best way to move forward. A guy named Robert Dale wrote a book called To Dream Again. This life cycle that you're going to see in the PowerPoints based upon his book. I've changed some of the words and a little bit of the meaning, so, but I want to give credit. So churches start out with this idea of mission. They move to this place of identity that I'll talk about more later, to vision, to structure, and to good ministry. And if they stay healthy, they stay on that side of the life cycle. What happens is, is that soon they go into nostalgia and questioning. They remember the good old days. They remember when something was better than it used to be. Then they begin to question why. Eventually, polarization, they begin to blame. Well, it's your fault, or it's your fault, or it's your fault, and eventually you're gonna start having dropout. Well, how do you prevent this? How do you cure this? How do you deal with this? Because many of you, as you're watching this, you might realize we're on that side of the life cycle. We're in nostalgia already, or we're in questioning, or we're already in polarization, and something's not right. People are questioning why it's not right. Well, the huge mistake is, is that people go think, often think that when they go over the, the top of the, the life cycle, when things start going poorly, our first thing is to go back to structure. What's the new program we need? What's the new ministry we need? What's Brother Ralph doing at his church that we need to do? What's the latest book or fad or whatever we need to get on, on board with? And that's a mistake. Now it's better to go back to your vision and I'm gonna define what vision is later as far as what's your action plan to fulfill mission, that's better. But what you need to do is you gotta go all the way back to mission. If you wanna prevent this, go back to why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why do we exist? Why is this church here? And that constant loop on that side of the life cycle, that's how a healthy church keeps going. They just keep on growing because they constantly go back in this loop to ask those questions. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you five phases that I think a church has to go through for revitalization. I'm gonna do this very quickly. These five phases, uh, I'm writing about this more, so I'll, I'll try to help you through the center website to be aware of when more stuff is produced that you can get your hands on. But here are five phases you need to work through as a church, and I'm gonna break these down for you for the next couple of minutes. You have assessment, you have identification, you have vision development, you have adjustment, and you have implementation, not rocket science. And so when you read the books that we're gonna to recommend to you in, session, in part four of this, a lot of these are gonna say some of these things in a similar way. I wanna reinforce that, but these are five phases that if you wanna stay on that healthy side of a life cycle, you wanna experience revitalization, these are five phases you gotta go through. And I'm not speaking from the ivory tower of a seminary. I've consulted over 300 churches personally face to face, worked with entire denominations, worked with many other denominational entities. I was a senior pastor for, in, or, or pastor in, in pastoral ministry for over 20 years in local churches, all of them revitalization projects. I've started brand new churches as a church planter. I've pastored 216 year old churches. And so we, I've seen a few things and talked to a lot of people. So this is based upon a lot of this experience as well as the research to back this up. So pay attention to this, think about this, and see what you can do with it. So you'll see this in this visual, 
and you see that it's a continuous cycle, they form a loop. As soon as you're done with implementation, right back to assessment and continue. So let's talk about these things for a few moments. You've got the mission, here's why we're here. The first thing we want to do in a revitalization project, but this is also part of continuous church health, is assessment. We need to know what we're seeking to revitalize. We need to know who it is that we need to be. What are you seeking to be? What is the biblical standard for church? So Dr. Lawless just gave you an entire session on what a biblical church looks like. So I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. But you need this biblically objective standard for a plumb line in order to compare the other assessment that we're going to do. How do we know if we're healthy or not? We need to know what a healthy church looks like. So pay attention to what you've learned already. And then what we can do is we can start asking about the specific church in which you're now serving. Think about the past. Who has this church been? What has this church been doing? You can also look at your community and do those demographic studies. This is where some of that science comes into play into, into church revitalization. That foundation of biblical truth, we're gonna lay a little social science on top of that to help us to understand. Do some study, look at some demographics, look at what's going on around you, and then also identify what's going on right now. What are your programs and projects? Programs are simply, I'm not scared of that word, don't freak out over the word program. Program are just the things that you do on an ongoing basis. Your worship service is your biggest one, probably. Projects are those one-time events you do. So what's currently going on, do some study about that and compare that to what the past looks like. Do some graphing, do some statistical work there. Don't let the numbers scare you. They don't drive you, but they're tools to use to indicate to you just some of where the health is. Then what you're able to do is, is take, a, take a biblical model, an Acts 2 model, which has been a standard one, or certainly the one that Dr. Lawless just showed you, which is a great model, and then take a look at what you've done over the past 12 months in that program and project scenario. We used to do this as a staff. We'd go to a room and, and throw whiteboards or, or butcher paper on the wall, and we would take the church calendar, and we'd begin to think about, here's every single thing we did in this past year. And we'd actually begin to put them into these purpose categories. And we would begin to see how unbalanced we are or how we were weak in one area and strong in another. And it really helped us to do some assessment as to what's going on in your church. So there's a practical exercise you could do next week with your leaders. Think about what you've done in the past year and how you're really being proactively purposeful in building that biblical church. And so then what we begin to do is, is we move from assessment to what we call identification. And this is often overlooked and it's a shame because based upon who we've been, based upon who we are, based upon this assessment, this is who we currently identify ourselves as. This is our profile. If, I, if someone were to ask you, who is First Baptist Church? Or who is, you know, Journey? Who are you? This is how you're going to describe yourselves. This is who we are. Before we get to what, before we get to how, we need to know who. Who are we? What are the expectations? What are we looking at? So we create a current profile based on this assessment. And we're gonna talk about things like core competencies. Uh, I'm gonna mention this again in some of the other parts, but this idea of here are our discipleship goals. Dr. Lawless has mentioned this. Here's who we need to be. This is what we need to know. And this is what we need to do. I challenge churches, it's been fascinating to me over the years. I challenge churches to write these out. I find so few churches who ever have. These are actually the core. This is what it means to be a member of this church. This is what it means to be a disciple of this church. And these are written out not just for leadership to know, not just for the billboards and the bumper stickers, but these are things that drive. So this is what we're going to teach in small group. This is what we're going to teach in our various studies that we do. This is how we uh, deal with accountability. These are the standards. These are the expectations of who we are as a church. And this is so vital because now you're laying this foundation of biblical discipleship. Now we can start thinking about, okay, what are we gonna do next because of this? So then we can create this profile. We can even ask questions about how many are we really and get honest about membership and deal with, deal with these overinflated church roles and unregenerate church membership issues and really begin to lay some expectations. This can even help you how, to understand how much your budget ought to be once you start working through this together. And this is what our budget ought to be about. See, and so this is gonna help you so much to figure out where you need to be. Then you move into vision development. 
which is what a local church needs to practically do in order to fulfill the mission based upon your assessment, based upon your identification. Here's who we're going to be. These are the things that we're going to do in this specific place at this specific time with this specific money, these specific people, and, and work through those processes of developing that. Then you move to adjustment, which is often by far the most difficult. You might have to stop things. You might have to start things. You might have to replace people. And remember, uh, I often say this about repentance, that this is a spiritual and practical thing that you're working through. And that um, re revitalization and repentance often require replacement. Uh, true repentance means that I'm gonna not just quit the, the sin in my life, I'm gonna replace the sin in my life with the positive spiritual disciplines of God. I'm not gonna be drunk with wine, I'm gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's replacement therapy. And so this idea of I'm actually gonna walk with God, not just walk away from God, it's not enough just to stop and say I'm sorry for my sin, I've gotta replace that void with the positive things of the kingdom. Same thing's true in revitalization. What are you doing wrong? Let's get those train cars off the track. Let's get the bumper cars put away. Let's build the right train at this point, this time, in this context. And, that, and what happens is, is we've got to begin to understand reality. We've got to begin to work through and identifying what's standing in the way, what are the obstacles, what buffalo are standing on the tracks. You can carry that train analogy as far as you want to go. You know, we got to get the buffalo off the track and who are they? We got to get the brakes off. What's going on? Who won't get on board? Who will get on board? Work through all those issues and then finally you get to actually implement and this is where you really begin to build expectations hear those hear those core competencies these become a part of your new member processes these become a part of ongoing discipleship but then the thing you got to remember is as soon as you enter into this phase you constantly you go right back to assessment why are we doing this why do you know we started this new why did we start this new ministry why are we do, and you're constantly asking this question you're constantly engaged in this loop in these phases as you're working through this together and you're communicating this is so vital that this isn't just hidden knowledge amongst the elders or the pastors or the staff but that this is communicated to the congregation and that the basic average church member out there has a clear understanding this is what i'm expected to be this is who i'm expected to be this is what i'm expected to know this is what i'm expected to do and they have this understanding and i have training and i have ministry opportunities either through small groups or whatever your you know you might have wednesday night studies whatever your schedule might be those kinds of life group things to where i'm being i'm being trained but i'm also being given the opportunity to live this out and i understand it i understand understand the train and understand why we're heading in this together. So as we work through that, then we reproduce this new DNA. It's from generation to generation. It becomes a vision-based, mission-fulfilling structures and ministries. So what we're doing and how we're doing it is all tied back into why and who. And I promise you, if you start working through that and really take that seriously and look for future tools from us, this is gonna help you not only have a healthy church and stay on that healthy side of the life cycle, but help you in that revitalization process as well. So listen to the next session. We're gonna give you some good resources to follow up on this, and I think they're gonna be beneficial for you.